back to No Chill with Gilbert Arenas. Uh, our guest today, you can see the resemblance, but <laughs> one of the best hoopers to come out of Los Angeles. And the reason I have this sexy gap tooth, and yes, gap, gap teeth are sexy. Don't let them lie to you. Yeah. But five-time All-Star, three-time All-NBA. A lot of people don't know this, but you were the first Crip to win the Wooden Award. <laughs> Maybe the last one, too. Maybe. Oh, man. And, uh, you gonna you know, get, you're going to get me beat up out there, man. <laughs> yeah. You played the iconic role of Raymond in White Man Can't Jump, and now you can catch him covering Bucks games where he's an Emmy Award winning analyst. My pops, Marcus Johnson, we finally got you on your preacher. Yes, yeah, man, yes. Thank you, man. My pleasure. Pleasure being here. Big fan of the show. Love what oh, you guys are doing, man. Yeah. I mean, I see you came through with the, all the smoke, but we support, hey, we hey, support listen, other pops. Listen, we're both... Cross promoting. Okay. This is I am athlete. Okay. <laughs> now what is I am athlete? Who is that? What is that? That's Brendan it. um Marshall. Brendan Marshall them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. We support black businesses on this show. <laughs> all right, all right. Start circulating black, black broadcasters. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we show support. Before we get into it, there was a point when you had the argument for best hooper in LA. Yeah. And obviously I'm biased. But when you look around now, you know, you talk about Raymond Lewis, you talk about these, these current guys that have come through the, the Hardens and Westbrook right. of the world. In your opinion, who is the best hooper to come out of Los Angeles? Whew, man, that's a tough one, man. Um, that's a real tough one. Just when I, when, I, when I could have made that claim, so it was myself, Raymond Lewis, probably Gil Goodrich, Sidney Wicks, who uh, was just an outstanding High school player at Hamilton won a couple of nat well three national championships at UCLA, but he was responsible for two of them himself uh, when he matched up with Artis Gilmore and dunked on him and blocked his hook shot and, and everything else. So then all of a sudden, where does Chris Mills rank? Um, <laughs> he's you know he's on the list somewhere. I, I don't know how high. Okay. Uh, and 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 the reason I say that when I, when I say that I look at the whole body of work. And so what did a guy do in high school? And then what did he do in college? Then what did he do as a pro? Mm. And that's, that's kind of how, when I, when I look at the all time. So when they talk about me and Raymond Lewis, Raymond Lewis was a great high school player, obviously, and uh, someone that we all kind of idolized growing up. College, averaged 30 plus points a game Damn. as a sophomore at Cal State <laughs> LA. Uh, pro, dropped the, dropped the 60 in the second half or whatever, at halftime on Doug Collins and walked out of camp and never, never got a chance to show just how, how great of a pro he could be. Uh, so that's why I would say, you know, looking at my total body of work as, as a first team all pro at 22 years old, uh, my second year in the league in the NBA, 26 a game, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it, to me, that, that's where I would stand with that at that time. Now, since that point, you've had the emergence of, you know, Paul Pierce from Inglewood and Russell Westbrook and what he's done as an MVP and averaging triple doubles for what, three or four years, which four, is just four. just four years, which is just crazy to me. Um, um, uh, Kawhi Leonard, who was in the empire, but we, I guess. Do we, do we, do we, uh, we got to set this thing. Because we don't rock with the IE like that. Nah, nah, we don't. We don't. Be, <laughs> no, it's like, that's what I said. It's just like the Valley. That's my main thing. <laughs> well, like you said the names, I'm like, all I got to compete with is Gil Cutridge. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the polytech or whatever. But yeah, yeah. yeah you know, that, so, so it's real, real territorial when it comes to that cut. And, and for us, for a long time, it was almost like city versus city. CIF, you know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. City ball was a whole different breed, and we always considered ourselves to be superior to the yeah. CIF, and the CIF was just kind of like, I mean, they're cool, they're good, but, <laughs> but they're not on the level of, like, the city ball players. But, but all that's changed. All that's changed, and right now, like I said, with the uh, emergence of, uh, of, uh, of uh, some of these great players, uh, Paul Pierce and, and uh, Russell Westbrook and, and James Harden. I mean, James yeah. Harden out of RT. I did his games at high school. His, his, his finals against uh, Modern Day yeah. and the Weird Twins. And, and, and Taylor that, King that and that whole crew. And they had, who they have? Ronaldo, Ronaldo Sidney, yeah. who I thought as a 10th grader was headed to becoming one of the all-time legends to, to come out of the city, transferred to Fairfax, and, and just never, never materialized into the kind of player that I thought he'd be, which goes to show that it's nothing's a given. You know, that, 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 see, I thought this guy was just some, some hot shot 5'10 Mexican out of Van Nuys <laughs> High School for years. I see Gilbert Arenas, you know, in the, in the newspaper, 30, 35. I was like, okay, this little Mexican must be able to shoot the ball or something. <laughs> And then when I saw he signed with Arizona, I was like, Luke Olson, like signed a Mexican, really? That's okay. He must be really good. And then when I saw him as a, uh, saw him play in high school, saw him play as a freshman mainly, it's like, oh, okay, now, now it all makes sense. <laughs> now, now, now it all makes sense. Live bodied, active, yeah, athletic. Listen, I have friends I grew up with, but because I always with my GA, they came to a game and I was like, yo, what y'all doing over here? Like, 
He was like, yo, I came to see the Mexican uh, Gilbert Arenas. <laughs> yeah, right. Mexican, Gil- I'm Gilbert. Yeah. It was like, no, you're GA. Gilbert Arenas? Right, like, right. I didn't like Gilbert. Like, right, it just okay. sounded Mexican. Okay. And he was like, oh, man, I ain't coming to see your sorry yeah, ass. No, it just, but everyone thought I was Mexican. Yeah, no, no. I, I did for a minute, too. But then <laughs> uh, after seeing you in Arizona, then I, I knew what the, what the, what the real deal was. And, and so, so anyway, to ask your question, I've kind of bumped myself from top five, like into top ten-ish. Okay, you know, that's it, respect. It, yeah, that, that's you know. why I rock with you. That's yeah. why you know I appreciate you as a parental figure because you're always gonna keep it real. Yeah, but yeah. We don't really gas or juice in our family. Like we, <laughs> I'm just saying, we <laughs> no, like you know. Well, you MVP like Russell Westbrook. You do with James Harden. Harden won MVP. Yeah, yeah. Harden, yeah. MVP. You MVP in the league. I mean, the, you know, he, you got to acknowledge that. Paul Pierce with the championships and the clutch, the clutch performances. Paul Pierce actually went to Crenshaw. As a 10th grader, I don't know if you know that story. Well, I think it was 10th grade. I'm I'm not, I'm not. But Chris was a junior, and Paul was, I think, a year behind him. But but we didn't know he was there at the tryout uh, until we saw his his, uh, medical card or whatever he filled out. And Coach West showed me after after Paul Pierce had had, had emerged at Inglewood as this superstar CIF player. You know, he was here for trials. I was like, nah, it's here. Yeah, it was too many Crips for him. Yeah, we had no friends. We talked to Paul about that uh, (laughs) on Star Weekend. He was like, I had to. What did he say? Too many. It was just too much. Too many. Too many Crips. Too much blue going. Too much blue going on over there. Yeah, yeah. So, but but that was the kind of talent that Crenshaw had. So anyway, so that's kind of where it was, man. But but the city was always thought of as. Back in those days, as the mm-hmm. elite level, I mean, there were some great CIF ball players. But if you were a city ball player, you just felt felt like you were on top of all that. It's hard to look at the schedules now because it'll be like Brentwood versus Crenshaw, yeah, or, yeah. And, it, oh, and you think in your head like, see, oh. So me now watching because of my son's playing and trying to figure out what's going on, CIF is the new city. Yeah, right. right. So right. basically, everybody started going to private schools. Sure. Right, and all those, they've been busting all Sarah these Canyon. kids. Yeah, they've been busting all these kids. So, like, now you're Birmingham's and Grant beat Crenshaw to go to the championship. Right. Like, it's stuff like that. Like, wait, wait, yeah. what, what Crenshaw? Not that same Crenshaw. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, it was like, yeah, they said the city schools now are not actually. Yeah, yeah well, and a lot of it, too, is... Like Crenshaw, just the, uh, the just the demographic now. It's, it's Hispanic area. Soccer's like the bigger bigger sport. Mm. I think the football team was able to field twenty yeah, players like, yeah, so total this year and made it to the championship game. Basketball, everybody's playing two sports. Oops. I know the coach there, Ed Waters, uh, Maxine Waters' his son, who has been my best friend since the seventh grade at Audubon mm. Middle School. Uh, who played at Crenshaw with me, but he's a coach there. So now just, just, just fielding a team of, of, of nine, ten solid yeah, players is, 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 a, is a challenge right now. So what he's doing over there for me has been remarkable, getting to the you know, final four basically every mm-hmm. year with Crenshaw. So you talked about all those guys, and you say you're still top ten, but none of those dudes uh, had their poster on the wall of Michael Jordan. Well, there you college. go. Yeah, no. Right. So if you've seen The Last Dance, you, you know, we'd always saw the Sports Illustrated joint. That was always a claim to fame. We got to see some audio and video behind it with Jordan talking about how he wanted to go to Adidas because right. he rocked with, the, you know, the Lakers and Kareem, but he, he rocked with you as well. So what does it mean to you to know that Jordan was rocking with you that heavy? Uh, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's a big honor. I mean, it, you know, it means a lot, shit. I mean, it's Michael Jordan, mm-hmm. you know. And, and, the, and the funny story is, is the, uh, the uh, Space Jam uh, film shoot out here in L.A. At, on the Burbank Studios. And, and so Michael Jordan calls up UCLA and, and, and tells them to, to, to bring some players out. He's in town. They've got a whole facility out there with the Long Beach State floor and a big dome and just great basketball every day. Grant Hill and Jawan Howard and Patrick Ewing. And, I mean, just, just a who's who of basketball players. So they said, bring some, some UCLA players. My oldest son, Chris, was at UCLA. So I would take him up to the run every day. But before the run, we'd play a little lightweight three-on-three uh, before the uh, NBA guys got there. And I'm like in my 40s at that time. And so it's Dean Kane who's Superman, and sometimes Queen Latifah would get out there and mess around. So it's just real lightweight. So at the end of the run, I like did a little lightweight dunk. So Michael Jordan said, uh, hey, old man, hey, old man, don't be trying to dunk. Don't be trying to dunk. That wasn't part of your game. That wasn't part of your game. And I was like, man, look, whatever I was doing, you had my poster on your wall in college. So I was doing something right. He said, oh, yeah, you got me there. You got me there. Yeah, you used to be my favorite player. I used to love your game. I used to love your game. So that was, uh, you know, that was kind of my, I, so I knew beforehand. Then to see it in Last Dance, to see him actually say it on video. It's funny, Chris, uh, my oldest son, Joe, he, 
he got wind of that video beforehand, and, and, and he's like, Dad, I'm gonna send you something, but you can't tell nobody. This is before the episode of Last Dance came yeah. out. And he, he sent it to me, and uh, I, I didn't know what he was talking about, because I, I thought they had me doing some, you know, some compromising position back in the day. <laughs> I, I didn't know what it was. Dad, Hand Dad, on the hip. <laughs> Dad, you can't tell anybody. Uh-huh. You can't tell anybody. And then he sent me the video, and it was Michael saying, yeah, yeah, Marcus Johnson, I'm a big fan of Marcus. I love Marcus Johnson. He's one of my favorite players, whatever, whatever. So, you know, it, it, you know it, it, it's it's a big honor. It's a huge honor to have that happen like that. So he so so basically he stole your 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 name. MJ. Yeah, I mean, he stole you, so you're the original MJ. Uh, oh yeah, man, we need to yeah. we need to hey, we need to go. Hey, we coming for you. Yeah, he no, needs his no, checks. No, no, but some he, shoes at least. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but but, but I, you know, and the thing about it for me as, as a ball player, as we are, I mean, you, I can see. Like for me, you know, the guys I, I grew up idolizing, Dr. J. Elder Bell, I mean, you could see some influences. And for, for Michael, if I look at his game, I mean, I could see just the 6'6", six, six, the, 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 the fundamentally sound type mm-hmm. stuff that he does, and the mid-range game and all that stuff that I was doing back in the day. And not that he looked at that and studied that and like I'm a pattern of my game after, but as youngsters, you know, we are all impacted by the people that, that, that we respect okay. and idolize as players. Mm-hmm. And I can see a couple of elements if I look hard enough, oh, no, yeah, 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 yeah. really, really hard. Get a microscope, really, really look. I can see a few of them, but it's an honor, man. It's, it, it's a big honor. So we talk about goat, you know, and goat for me feels like a generational term. Like you know, some people, Dr. J, Kobe, Jordan, LeBron, whatever it may be. But who who was the goat when you were coming up? Who was that dude you were like, this is him? Yeah, I mean, for me, L.A. guy, it was Elgin Baylor okay. I mean, with the Lakers. And if you look at his numbers today, I mean, you know, a bunch of years averaging over 30 points a game. I think he averaged like 19.8 rebounds in 36 a game as a 6'5 mm-hmm. small forward back in those days. And, and, and granted, a, a lot of shots were missed. The field goal percentages were down in the mid 40s. So it was a lot more rebounds to be had. But to be able to dominate the way he did and his body control, and his ability to finish and, and the spins and the reverses. And you know, there's footage of him. If you YouTube him, you'll see him dunking on Bill Russell. You'll see him Euro stepping mm-hmm. back in the 60s. Just we call too- it the Elgin step. We don't, you know. <laughs> you know he yeah. said the, the El- Elgin yeah. step. Well, they try to act like Sharudis Marshallonis, who was right. your teammate with the Warriors, and, and Manu were the guys that really, yeah. you know, popularized it. But I was looking at video back from late 50s, early 60s. Yeah, no, the, the one, two. And that's a move that I would actually practice in the backyard. And I didn't. It was, there was no name to it, but you take one this way and a big one, one this, this way, one and then and then finally shoot the layup because you knew you had two steps to get to the basket. So if you could misdirect the defender, you know, with with the, with the, with the wide breath of going this way and going back the other way, you know. And I'd use that on the playgrounds, use that in games sometimes, and uh, and yeah. But Elgin Baylor. With, uh, with, the, with the, his ability, his hang time, his ability to hang in the air. Chick Hearn, the broadcaster for the Lakers, would, would, would give him his props all the time, just talking about you know, how he'd float from one side to the other and then he'd spin it off the glass. And I mean, he made some of the most incredible shots that I've ever seen. And, and so he was a guy that I grew up, uh, and you, again, you look at his number, I think his career he averaged like 28 and 13 or something like that. Yeah, I still want to say it's like second or third highest. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. So is your top three goats? Okay. Is it the same as our generation? No, How we no. Okay. Will Chamberlain goes in mind. See, Will, Will, See, this generation, okay. nobody includes Will. People like, to, and I'm gonna get a lot of, I think, uh, 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 flack for this. Who's young kids? So they they're gonna hate no matter what you say. Yeah, so yeah, like. but 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 people like the great, the late great just passed away, Bill Russell. And Bill's, Bill's get, Russell's impact on the game defensively was 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 beyond parallel. I mean, nobody even you know came close back in those days what he was doing. But in terms of just skill, I mean, Wilt's game was just one of such beauty and grace and power and athleticism. I mean, and this is Wilt, like early Wilt, Philadelphia 76ers Wilt, Philadelphia Warriors Wilt back in the early 60s when he's averaging, you know, he averaged a 50 a game and always 20 plus rebound. But it's fadeaways, Bill. <laughs> but, but, but it's not just dunking and mm-hmm. overpowering. It's fadeaways. It's handling. There's that video clip, clip of him taking off by, the, by, by half court and then, then faking the pass this way and throwing a no look. He played with the Globe Trotter, so he had that flair when he wanted to. He could bring that out of his game. And, uh, you know, was one of the league leaders in assists, I believe, one year, maybe with the Lakers or something. But Wilt was, uh, I mean, I, I just can't. And, and I had a chance to play with him. At UCLA, Wilt's probably in his mid 40s. He would come down and play with us uh, full court, and I got a, I've got a photo of him on the floor. But he would come down there and, and would just pace himself, wouldn't try and dominate. 
But there's a story that I tell, like after one uh, uh, scrimmage, of us going up and down, open run, going up and down, we're playing two on two. So it's me and Wilt against David Greenwood, who's a third pick in the draft, Bourbon Day, 6'10", sweet shooting forward, and Roy Hamilton, uh, 6'2", guard out of Bourbon Day also, both played at UCLA. And so we're playing two on two, right? Me and Wilt, David Greenwood. So David Greenwood's talking crap. You know, oh, come on, old hey, Wilt's guard, David. <laughs> come on, old man. Oh, God, you kind of stutter a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wilt, get, you're, you're too old for that. Yeah, this is in your face, Wilt, you know. So Wilt pulls me over and says, Marcus, pass it to me every single time. <laughs> I was like, all right. So Wilt posts David up. I feed him the ball down low. I swear to God, he takes a dribble. He dunks on him like seven, eight times in a row <laughs> to gain point. And then David leaves the court. Fuck you, Wilt. You, you know, all pissed off, but, it, it, but that's, that, that's kind of what Wilt was about in terms of even in mid-40s being able to dominate a guy who's like 23, 24 years old. So for me, to answer your question in a, in a long-winded way, Wilt, any top three for me is Wilt. I mean, I almost got to put Dr. J in there just because of the, because of the, uh, the, the impact that he had on the game. Uh, he would be in there, and I think Michael Jordan would be in there. You know, if I, had, if I had to just throw three off the top of my head right now, you know, and you know, I'm leaving out Kareem, I'm leaving out a, a lot of great players I have a lot of respect for, but for me, Wilt is always gonna be Wilt. Dr. J, for me, growing up in the early 70s, the Virginia Squires, Dr. J, the ABA game of the week that came on Saturday mornings <laughs> in LA at 10 o'clock. That Dr. J, I mean, I saw some stuff that he was doing that I've never seen anybody ever do before. And for me, that, that's the kind of uh, impact that when I think of a top three, if I had a top five, of course, Kareem would be in there and I'd you know, throw somebody else in there. I don't See, know I, I, t I had an argument with someone and I said, we talk about Jordan, Kobe, and LeBron as a top three, but there's a generation yeah. that doesn't even acknowledge. Right. <laughs> they don't acknowledge this group. <laughs> and I yeah. said, if you ask someone yeah. who played in the 60s and the 50s and yeah. the 70s, I said, Dr. J, is gonna be in there before Jordan. Yeah. He was the Jordan right. of that era. And you're not gonna, they said back then, like when you hear about Dr. J, it's like basically he had this like, this aura that walked with him. Like I see it now in the big three. Like when he walks, I'm like, yeah, yeah, right. yeah he's him. <laughs> right. Right. And, and I said, you know, there's, a, there's, there's the era that they don't have the platform to talk. Right. But if you let them talk, Dr. J is yeah. a top three goat. Yeah. And see, and I saw him in live, I saw him in person live, um, flew down to the, uh, don't ask me how we got the tickets, in Denver, but we flew down when I was a junior at UCLA to Denver to the ABA finals. So it was Dr. J and David Thompson. Mm -hmm. And you talk about, so David Thompson, Skywalker, 48 inch vert. Uh, they were going at it. Both probably had close to 40 points, mid thirties or whatever. But there's one play in particular. Doc is coming down the right side of the floor. David's running with him. Doc takes off just outside the, the, the free, just inside the free throw line at the elbow. And he goes up and David goes up and they're as high as anybody I've ever seen in my life. But Doc keeps going. David starts coming down. Doc keeps going and just bam, he dumps that thing so hard with that one hand. And I mean, the people in Denver were just kind of erupted with awe based on what he was doing. But I've seen him do some stuff. And, and so when I matched up against him, he was, uh, I was 22, he's probably 27, 28. I think I'm six years older than him. Mm -hmm. and so he, he slowed down just a little bit. He wasn't doing the same type of stuff he's doing at 23, 24, but he was still, you know, he, he did the rock, the rock, the cradle, <laughs> on, you know, you're on coop, you know, you know that one. He was still, he'd still be able to pull it out, uh, the, the spectacular stuff. And, and for me, I mean, his ability to, my first time playing against Dr. J was, was in a, uh, Willie Nalls, my agent, former great NBA player with the Celtics and New York Knicks. Uh, he was my agent and business uh, advisor for years and years and friend, more than anything else, played for UCLA. But he had, a, he had the Soulville Foundation. He had some games, uh, charity games. He played three charity games, two in Hawaii, one in LA. And so Dr. J played uh, this summer, going into my rookie year. And that was my first time matching up against him. And I did, well, I had 30, you know, it's, summer, it's summertime. Mm -hmm. So I had a couple of 30-point games. But he hit a hook shot in Hilo, Hawaii from half court at the buzzer to win the game. He's one of them dudes. Just, you know, it's, it's, it's count, count, shot clock winding down, game clock winding down, people five, four. He just throws up a hook from half court, bottom, swish, you know, just runs, it cool, just runs cool, off cool, the floor. Drunk. And so, I mean, just, uh, yeah, he's always, he's always going to be a guy that I idolize because of the impact he had on, on the sport. He's a guy that, 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 that uh, made the ABA and NBA kind of want to merge together because of what he brought uh, to the table as a player. So you said ABA finals. I don't want to, you know, as much as you can reveal and talk about 
But I remember you telling me the story, uh, you know, Larry Brown, Herb Brown, yeah. that whole situation. So <laughs> what happened with that? Because you almost ended up, you know, Marcus Johnson, the NBA player, was almost Marcus Johnson, the ABA yeah. player. Yeah. So, so what, what happened with that? Well, we got time? We got time for this? I mean, you know, <laughs> keep, keep, so keep it, keep it's it you. Thing. Okay, all right. So by junior year, 1976, so we, we lost to Indiana, the, the team that went 33-0, Kent Benson and Scott May and Quinn Buckner, Bobby Knight, that whole crew. We lost to them in the Final Four. So in the consolation game, that was the consolation game days, mm -hmm. we played Rutgers, Phil Sellers and then uh, James Bailey and Mike Dabney and Eddie Jordan who played with the mm -hmm. Lakers. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were undefeated too. with the Wizards, yeah. Yeah, but they were, they were undefeated too, going into the tournament. They were like 32-0 and 0 or something. They were, it was Indiana and, and Rutgers, the two undefeated teams. And so uh, my coach, Gene Bartow, uh, what he did, he should have done against Indiana. He, and he told me this after uh, we, we beat Rutgers. But he started me at the two guard. So he started Ralph Dollinger, 7'2 for us, started David Greenwood, 6'10, started Richard Washington, 6'11, started Andre McCarter at the point at 6'4, and he started me at 6'6 at the two guard. And so, you know, you tell me I'm a two guard, now I'm just gonna take on the, you know, the mindset. I've got, the, you know, I'm just one of them dudes. That, okay, oh, I'm a two guard. I got a shoot jumper, I got a handle. Okay. So I went out and had like 35 and 17 hmm. rebounds. You know, in, in, in the Constellation game. And Larry Brown is there watching. And so Larry Brown's like, dude, I got to have this dude. Wow. And so, uh, so Denver of the ABA uh, started negotiating with me about leaving UCLA early. The merger was, was about to happen between the NBA and the ABA in 1976. Herb Brown, Larry's brother, was coaching the Pistons at the time. The Pistons were selecting third in the NBA draft. So the Pistons had offered me a contract of 125, 150, 175, 200, four years. ABA, Denver's going to give me 200 grand a year, spread out over 20, 50,000 a year. And so, I, but I went down to Denver for the, for the finals, saw the whole setup, and Larry, I love Larry, David Thompson, Bobby Jones, Monty Tao, just Gus Gerard, just this whole just, just exciting crew of guys uh, down in Denver. The, the McNich McNichols Arena was just live. Mm -hmm. And so I was ready to sign with Denver. Um, Larry Brown told her Brown that they were going to sign me out of UCLA without me going through the draft, they're just going to sign me. Carl Shear was a general manager for the Denver Nuggets, later my general manager with the Clippers. Herb Brown told his, his general manager, Oscar Feldman, that what was going on. They reported it to the league. The league said that if you sign this kid without him going through the proper procedures to draft and everything, no merger, merger off. You can't be doing that. You just can't be poaching these good players without any kind of procedure or whatever. So Denver backed off, said, okay, we're not going to sign him. I went back to Detroit and said, okay, Detroit, I'm yours. I'll take that 125, 150, 175, 200. Oscar Feldman, I'll never forget this conversation. On the phone with him, he's like, yeah, well, Marcus, look, we've, we've, we've kind of recalculated what we've got available, and we've got to reduce that down to 85, 90, and 95. I had no leverage, mm -hmm. you know. And so I was like, what? He's like, yeah, yeah, I mean, that offer's off the table, and, you know, we can't afford, you know. And so I just felt like, like I was totally just, just, you know, just whatever. And so I thought that was my only option. Um, my coach, Gene Bartow, called up Walter Byers, the head of the NCAA, and said, look, this Marcus is in this situation. Uh, the, the deadline to pull his name out of the NBA draft has passed. Is there anything that can be done? So Walter Byers is like, well, that's an NBA deadline. That's not an NCAA deadline. He can pull his name out the draft up until five minutes before the draft, two minutes before the draft. As long as he's not officially drafted, he can come back to school. As long as he... So we drove around the city, myself, Larry Farmer, and Gene Bartha looking for a fax machine. And there was no faxes around. <laughs> we Think went, about the time. Yeah, like, we, looking, we drove all around trying to find a fax. Finally found one at the Herald Examiner. The old Herald Examiner had one. And I went over there and I faxed a letter saying that I was officially taking my name out the draft. And so Larry and Herb Brown, I found this out years later, the two brothers didn't talk for 20 years over this. Uh, Aileen Voizan, a, a writer for the Sacramento Bee, she was covering the Clippers at the time. And she told me, she said, you know you're the reason why Larry and Herb didn't talk for 20 years. I was like, nah, what happened? She, and she told me the story. And it made sense because uh, Larry had shared that with Herb in confidence and he had taken it back to the owner and, and just kind of blew everything up. So that's, that's, that's that story. It was between the brothers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> some, some, some real life, some yeah. real life drama. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about, you know, current times. You're working with the Bucks now. Yeah. Uh, you know, Gil, you have some strong opinions about Giannis, but I will say in your defense, you, you do have in your top two, right? KD and Giannis, I think no, you said on the previous really? show. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm team Giannis, okay. man. What are you talking about, man? Okay. I don't know, this Giannis crazy. slander. 
<laughs> crazy. We changed. I've been changed. a Bucks fan and from the beginning. Yeah, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I see. This I is what I like video. to see. I've seen the video. Oh, yeah. I've seen the video. I didn't know people in Milwaukee got cable. So, <laughs> yeah, right, right. You know, I wasn't really, I we, wasn't really we, careful we, with the word. Just, we just got it last, like, two months ago. We got it hooked up. But, you know, you've been with the, with the Bucks like five, six years. Eight years, eight, 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 eight seasons. Yeah, we eight eight seasons. yeah. But what have you seen Giannis's growth over that period just as a hooper, and how much work is he actually putting in to elevate his game? Well, this thing I love about Giannis, and, 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 and your point, you know, it, it's not totally off base. It's just in terms of overall, if you're going to give a guy a, a trophy for being the most skilled, I mean, Giannis, in terms of shooting, mm-hmm. and that's where with Giannis, the big issue is. Mm-hmm. And as ball players, that's a big issue. Yeah, that, yeah. That's a big issue. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that is a major, major, I don't want to say flaw, but, but it's a shortcoming that he readily admits, especially at the free throw line nowadays. But for me, over these eight years, he was 19 when I first got there, about to turn 20, December 6th. And I thought that maybe he could eventually morph into a player who could give you a solid 17, 18 a game, 9, 10 rebounds at, at his size, 6'11", 7 feet. But the dude has got this work ethic, man, that, that, and, and this drive to be great. He's a dude that was selling trinkets on the streets of Athens at 3 o'clock in the morning when he was 14, 15 years old. Uh, him and his family, it's, it's well documented, kind of what they went through, especially uh, Rise, the, the great movie about his life. And so he's got this, he's, he's on some different stuff, as we used to say. He's on, on just different shit. You know, Giannis is. We right say now. shit, not stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, we can okay. curse on this. Okay, okay, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't but, but he's on some different shit, man. And, and, and I've seen it up close and personal, his work ethic. I mean, he's a guy that'll drop 40 in the game. I've seen it. He dropped 40 in the game, didn't feel good about his free throws. I'm leaving in Milwaukee, outdoors, going to my car. And it's probably six degrees below zero. It's freezing, and I see a I see this tall, shadowy figure of a guy in a, in a undershirt, shorts on, and with your socks and shoes, kind of kind of darting through the crowd. I'm like, who's that crazy fool? Like as cold as it is out here, it was Giannis running to the practice facility to shoot free throws. You know, without the ladder. You know, this mm-hmm. is Giannis get headed over there yeah. to work on his free throws. I've I've seen him drop 40 and get on a team plane and and, and have a film breakdown with with uh, Sean Sweeney our assistant at the time, on what he could have done better. And it's, and it's all genuine. It's not, it's, it's funny, I, I saw him when he was about 21, 22, and it was uh, New Year's Day. And we're in the uh, team uh, uh, cafeteria, team eating facility, it's not a cafeteria, it's, 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 it's a restaurant, basically, mm-hmm. a team, the team dining hall. And so <laughs> I'm just like, so, yeah, Giannis, uh, what was your New Year's resolution? And he thought for a minute, he's like, mm, to be the best version of myself. Like, <laughs> who is this guy? <laughs> you know, at 22, I'm trying to figure out like how, what time the club closed, yeah, or what, yeah, yeah. what's last call gonna be? I'm, you know, he's, throwing, he's throwing out all that kind of stuff at 22 years old. So he's wise beyond his years. He's got this worth ethic, ethic that's off the hook. He's as genuine as it comes. We got off the team plane, I swear to God, uh, December 5th, we may have played somewhere, I forget where, but we flying back to Milwaukee that night. And so it's after midnight when we land, and it's actually December 6th, his birthday, and he's at the front of the plane with the NASA's and the other guys he plays cards with, and he's sitting on the top of, he's sitting on the edge of the seat, you know, and just like, it's my birthday, it's my birthday, it's my birthday, and I go, well, my, well, happy birthday, young fella. He's like, it's my birthday, it's my birthday, it's my birthday, you know, just, just, we're just all excited at 27 years mm-hmm. old. He's got this genuine excitement about life, man, that uh, it's really, it's really refreshing, but his work ethic is a thing that is, allowed him to, look at 27, he's a two-time MVP, mm-hmm. he's a finals MVP, he's had a 50-point game in the finals, he knocked down 17 out of 19 free throws in a, in, a, in a closeout game six against the Suns at 27. And my thing is, if he, if he never played a, 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 a minute of basketball, he's first ballot Hall of Fame right now just mm-hmm. based on that alone, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yes, he's, he's, and the thing about it, every year, and I've said this on the air, Every year, there's something he's got to work through, whether it's barreling over players with these offensive fouls a few years back, whether it's knocking down threes that, that, that he's having sh- troubles with, trying to shoot you know, 10% from the three-point line one year. He started off like three for 30-something. Uh, whether it's free throws like this year and the count and all that. It's like he's one of those guys that actually feeds off of that self-induced kind of pressure. You know, you know, you know guys yeah, like yeah, that. Mm-hmm. And Muhammad Ali was, a, was an athlete like that. Not to put Giannis on that level, but would predict the rounds and talk all the trash. But, but those are the guys that had that, that kind of um, drive that know that if they put the pressure on themselves to, to perform, 
that they're going to find that will to make it happen. And Giannis is one of those dudes, man. He's just one of those guys. So you talk about the 10-second uh, the free throw violations. We've seen Giannis get dinged a few times now uh, <laughs> against the Warriors. Yeah. Uh, Lakers, uh, Westbrook doing the count all out. So, I mean, I just want to ask you, Gil, like, do you feel like, you know, who's going to win that game of chicken, Giannis or the rule book, or does he need to change? Did they do that with Carmelo? That was a thing with Carmelo yes. one year where the whole crowd right. was counting. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's going to be more of a mental thing where he, he has to have his own count in his head. Because what's going to happen is eventually the crowd's going to start getting involved. And yeah. They're going to start doing that count on them. And it kind of, it will kind of mess them up a little bit, yeah. but it, it all depends on the ref. <laughs> you know funny. what I mean? And he, and I, and I clocked it, the, the Acosta, I forgot the ref's name, they called it on him a couple of times in the game against the Warriors. But, but he was 11, he was 11. And, you know, I thought it was kind of quick, and then I, I actually timed it, uh, just re- rewound the tape and timed it. But the, the, the ironic part is that when he played, uh, the World Games, the Euro Basket, whatever it was this summer that he played, Giannis, they've got a rule that you've got to shoot the ball within five seconds after it's handed to you. Okay. You know, an international rule or whatever. Giannis shot 78.6% okay. with that, you know, under that rule. So yeah, he's, I would have asked, what was the percentage then? It was higher. Yeah, yeah, right? he's 78.79%. He's, he's, he's not thinking as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just give me the ball, now I got to shoot. So my thing is, like, and I think uh, Stan Van Gundy mentioned something about it the other night, like, hey, just, you know, just take a couple of dribbles and shoot it. And not, <laughs> it's not like he's 90% with that routine anyway. <laughs> and so um, I think you'll see him make the adjustment. He works with uh, Josh Oppenheimer who uh, was a little gym rat at UCLA when I was playing, uh, in, in the, playing in the NBA in the, in the 80s. Uh, Josh was an assistant with Jason Kidd when I first got there and he walked up to me, Joe, he's like, do you remember me? And I looked at like, nah. Then I saw these light green, eight, green <laughs> eyes that he has that are real dis- you know, just distinguishes him from everybody else. I'm like, Josh? He was like, yeah, yeah. So, but he works with Giannis. He's a, he's a shooting guy. And they do a lot of creative stuff. I mean, Giannis, they shoot at different baskets in the training facility at the end of pe- practice just so he didn't get comfortable at one hoop. And, you know, so he's a, and Giannis has embraced this challenge. He's like, look, I know I need to work on my free throws. I know I need to make them in, in, in the clutch. And I'm, 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 I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it happen. And, you know, we saw it against Phoenix. You know, he struggled. They started counting that series. Mm-hmm. It was in his head. He was missing some clutch situations. All of a sudden, game 60, 17 for 19. Yeah. He, he's had a couple of games, maybe that year or last year, where he's 17 for 17. He's 14 for 14. You know, he's 16 for 16. I mean, so he's, uh, it's in there. My thing is that if it's in there, if I see it in there, I know that there's the opportunity to get it to come he out should, consistently. He should do more of his practice in, inside the arenas. Yeah. Versus practice arenas because of the space and maybe yeah, just he's the background and everything. It's, yeah. it's the background. Well, but, but it's just it's it's he works so hard on it, man. I'm telling you that it's just it's just <laughs> it's, all, it's mental. It's all it's all and and he's just gotta <laughs> and either he will but but the thing about him that and, and Wilt was the same way that Wilt shot fifty percent, fifty to sixty percent every year from the free throw line. If that he tried the underhand, he tried these different styles, but he was one of those guys. And I, you know, I could do it earlier in my career that if I, if I, and you may be able to do this too, that if you, if you messed up on one thing, you're going to make it up doing something else. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm going to get a steal. I'm going to get a block. I'm going to get a tip dunk. You know, if, I, if I'm not hitting free throws, I'm going to go in here and get me a couple. I'm going to dunk on somebody backwards or do something just for my own type of, uh, of, 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 of rebuilding up my own confidence, confidence. more than anything else. Yeah. So when you look at the Bucks, what do you feel like their ceiling is this year, and what team do you think has the most smoke for them? Is it the Celtics or somebody else? Mm, man, that's a good question. I, it's, <laughs> and I love the Celtics, but I'm still not completely sold on, sold on them. And I think Golden State, I think it was kind of not exposed them, but it just, just knocked them down off the, off the perch a little bit. Everybody's kind of giving them the championship after a month. We're a month in. Now, of course, Robert Williams is going to make a difference. Uh, Malcolm Brogdon has made a difference, but the reason that we weren't bemoaning not re-signing Malcolm was because he got hurt at, the, at, the, at just the most inopportune times, right before playoff time, foot injuries or leg injuries or something going on that would uh, keep him from, from e- e- either contributing or playing at all in the playoffs. Tatum Brown, I love them. I mean, I love, I love Smart, his toughness. I mean, I, I love that team. I love Missoula, what he's doing. I like the fact that he's got this soccer background here during the World Cup and he's the spacing and all that stuff that he's doing based on kind of his soccer experience. I like that kind of innovation, but I think the Bucks, look, you know, Mike Budenholzer took a lot of heat 
and some of it well deserved when we blew that two love lead against Toronto and Kawhi and uh, had a chance to, to, to do some big things uh, that year. Uh, C Coach Bud was, was, was really a stickler to staying with, uh, I forgot, he calls it corporate something, corporate, I forget the terminology, but, but you know, you stay with something until you absolutely are certain it's not gonna work. I thought there were times when he stayed with, with, with certain rotations or players or, 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 or schemes or whatever it was. Uh, this, the, the drop scheme that we used and, and the way this team was, was, um, was inviting teams to shoot three-point shots. We led the league in three-point field goal attempts by opponents the last two or three years. This year we've turned it around. He understands that, no, these guys are too good to, you know. <laughs> and it worked. We're shooting now. We're, we're, we're not only shooting, but... but these guys are like a Jordan Clarkson. I remember it dawned on me two years ago, I'm watching uh, him go against Giannis, uh, like three feet behind the three-point line. He went like through his legs twice behind his back, step back three. I'm like, this, this is a different, this, you know, these guys are working on this now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because they know this is the shot you're going to give up. So not only are they shooting, catch and shoot threes, but the pull, off, pull up threes off the dribble now, these guys are learning how to master that. So he's changed that up. And so now the three-point attempts by opponents, I think we're one of the top five in the league in terms of lowest three-point attempts. So, he's made, so Coach Bud has made the changes that needed to be made. I, I really like what they do, their coaching staff from, from the Popovich school of, 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 of holistic coaching. So they, they've got the daily vitamins where one coach is responsible for three or four players and you, you, you meet with them either on the court or in the office, talk about life, talk about basketball, talk about girlfriends, whatever it is, for 20 minutes every day. Mm. They, they make this connection with the players and show them that they care. Coach Whitten, I asked him, Joe, before I was going to coach the Belizean national team with Milt Palacio and a bunch of guys in 2010. I said, Coach, if you could tell me one thing about coaching, the most important thing, the most important aspect of coaching, Coach Wooden, what is it? And he looked at me and said, Marcus, you got to love your players. You got to love your players. You don't have to like them all. He said, you don't have to like them all. It's going to be something you don't like, but you got to love your players. And, and I think this is a part of kind of what this, this staff does from the Popovich school of, of, of establishing this rapport with players that, and you know how it is, you, you connect with a coach on that level, mm -hmm. assistant coach, head coach. coach. You're going to go out there and play for him. And I think we're seeing that with New Orleans. I read Willie Green. I was trying to figure out, what's Willie Green got going on down? Willie Green? How's he getting these guys, you know, he's not a championship. You know what I mean? He's not a, you know, who, Willie Green. But then you start reading some of the comments that his players make about him. And they talk about how much they love him, how much love he shows them, how much he's got, how much he's got their backs and through good times, through bad times. And so this staff does a great job with connecting. And I think that's why you're seeing Taylor Jenkins in Memphis uh, from Coach Bud's tree and uh, Darvin Ham, I think is gonna do a good job with the Lakers. They're starting to respond to him. And Anthony Davis, mm -hmm. to me, has really bought in like I've never seen him buy in in the last couple of years. Under Frank Vogel, did we ever see him buy in like sure. that? I doubt it, but I think they'll buy in with Darvin Ham. And, and so uh, with, with Coach Bud, with that in mind, with the talent that we have, Chris Middleton stays healthy. Uh, but Chris, Drew, Holiday, and Giannis, great big three, great role players. Um, Bobby Portis is just having a career year rebounding the basketball. But we're gonna be we're gonna be tough, man. We're gonna be tough to win. You look at the standings now. As well as Boston's played, I think we're tied with them in the loss column right now. You okay. Know? And you know we think about the Celtics and the juggernaut, and everybody's handing them the championship or at least the Eastern Conference title right now. You know, they're not just kind of running away with the East right now. We're right there kind of matching them, you know, game for game. I mean, as with this taping, you mentioned that uh, Southern should have had one more loss, but uh, he played the Lakers, uh, you know, 13-point <laughs> lead with like 340 to go. Yeah. And it's been tough. I mean, we've seen that a few times with the Lakers this year against the Sixers, obviously the Pacers with that 17-point that comeback. Yeah, yeah. You spent a lot of time with Darvin Ham uh, in Milwaukee. Yeah. You know, what have you seen from him so far this season with the Lakers, and do you think he's going to be able to turn the squad around to, to at least make them a, a playoff-level team? Yeah, well, I, you know, it, it would help to bring in another, I forgot who they're, Bogdanovich, I've read something, just rumors that they're talking about, the kind of a shooter, mm -hmm. score, consistent score. I mean, that would help, obviously. It would be Rob Polinka's got to figure something out uh, from that aspect. But Darvin, as a human being, Again, when I think of just being genuine and, and guys kind of um, um, uh, glomming to him as, 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 as a personality, the type of guy. Now, that's, that's, that's the one thing. But the most important thing, and you guys will feel me on this, when you're dealing with this generation of players, I mean, you've got to show that you will go there, <laughs> wherever that is. Uh -huh. You will go there. Mm -hmm. You're not going to talk to me any old kind of way. You're not going to show me any old kind of disrespect. You're not going to just run this shit around here, you know, and Darwin will go there. Now, he's, he's, he's as mild-mannered and as cool as you want him to be, 
but but you push him in the wrong direction. He's a Saginaw, Michigan, been shot, you know, <laughs> been shot, you know, from mom. Like water drinker. <laughs> you know, right. yeah, but, but but he's a guy that there's a fight going on, you know, or something almost about to happen during the course of a game. He's the first guy out there grabbing the, the opponent guy, and they're, they're trying to wrestle with him to get free, and he's just got him locked down in his death grip. Yeah. You, know, you know, he'll go there. And, and not that I'm, you know, I'm not advocating violence or fighting or anything like that, but you got to show these guys you mean business. Mm-hmm. And the fact that Russell Westbrook has, I think we can say, embraced right now coming off the bench. You look at his numbers and the field goal percentage <laughs> and everything else that's going on compared yeah. to winning as a starter. Gil, not a fan of, of Russ coming off the bench. And I got to be real. I mean, I think Russ has probably proven enough at this point, yeah. you know, that he deserves to be in that starting line. I mean, you look at the minute comparisons and the guys that are getting minutes above him, it's getting a little, it's like, okay, it was a cute thing at first. <laughs> yeah. But that's, a, that, that's always been my, my, my thing, that y- you're, we, you want him to come off the bench, cool. Right. Do you have a Jordan Poole that's, that you're going to start? Do you yeah. have, right. you know, these other guys, but you tell, I, I got to look at this roster like and say. Patrick Beverly starting to hit of him. And- yeah, you're like, Patrick Beverly's averaged, what, four or five points? Yeah. If he averaged what we booed Russell Westbrook last year with, if, right. if you give that, if you yeah. give that to Patrick Beverly, yeah, he, he will have a parade, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. it's like, and then you have Reeves, and it's like, come on, what are we doing here? Like, yeah. don't, don't, like, don't, don't do that. Like, I, I'm like, no, we're not even going to do that today. Yeah, but but I think, and you guys can relate to this, but but I think it goes even deeper psychologically, and it's not at, at Crenshaw, Joe. I mean, the, 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 the Maurice Duckett, the assistant coach who, whose rover defense Gilbert shredded to shreds when he was in high Gilbert school. Gilbert dropped 40 on, <laughs> yeah, on no, Crenshaw's Chris. notorious press. I remember seeing it, but coast to coast, we had a press called Rover. Rover used to literally give dudes fits. And Gil was the only human being I think I've seen. You talk about all the great point guards that have come through L.A. Yeah. at that time. Baron, 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 Baron. Yeah, Baron had some shit for it, too. I'm, I'm not yet. Yeah, Baron had some shit for it, but Baron petered out at the end. Baron, the, the crossroads was down one final seconds, and Baron had a wide open layup and just dropped the ball out of bounds because he was tired because yeah. that, that pressure kind of wore him yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, I heard Gil just, just shredded it. But <laughs> my point with Coach Duck and Coach West, but they would always say you got to break it, you got to break them down and then build them up. And so with Westbrook, I mean, right now it's just buying in. Now, so, so coming off the bench may not be a permanent solution. It's probably not. But at the same time, you want him to get off of the, 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 the how can I put it? The high uh, horse? No, but, not even a high. He deserves to be on a high. He's a four, you know, yeah. he's averaged, you know, the triple doubles four years, the MVP. He's, he deserves a level of respect, but at the same time, you need some team buy-in, and if this is what you got to do to get the team, was he, was he into the team buy-in as a starter initially based on just visuals and attitude and body language? It didn't look like it. Now he looks to be a guy that has really bought in to the team, whatever system, whatever, whatever Ham is doing. And, and now if you start him, it's, it's, a, it's a Westbrook with a little bit of a different attitude. I know, but that, that, that's, that's always been my problem. Like, when you're talking about buying in, how does a guy who probably considers himself mentally probably the most important piece besides LeBron James? Right. I'm pretty sure if you asked him, is he more important than Anthony Davis? He will probably snap and say, of course. Do you think you have a better career than Anthony Davis? Of course. So now you want me to come off the bench to Reeves and what's the name? And I'm considered the second best, most important player on this team. That's the problem that I was like, how is that going to, how are you going to, but how does that help you coming off the bench? That's mentally, that's, you know. But to your point, when watching the Boston game and some of the plays Westbrook was making late, I mean, he is, I won't say more important than LeBron or Anthony Davis, but he is just as important to their success as those two, him playing a certain way. Mm-hmm. You know, playing a certain way and being in the right mindset to play a certain way. And I just, I, I, just, saw, I just saw him fighting himself, fighting the system, fighting all the, all the rumors and all the innuendo and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the inability to knock down shots consistently last year and the, 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 the West Brick and all that, all that, you know, all the stuff, you know, all the stuff that fans throw at you and that he's coming. And, and look, I know I, I, went, I went from Milwaukee to the Clippers. It's a lot of pressure coming back home. And Russell's done a tremendous job. I mean, the, the Crenshaw YMCA, where I grew up playing, he's refurbished that, you know, put millions of dollars into making that just a state-of-the-art facility. Mm-hmm. He's done some great things for this city. And I think 
for him, I think he's headed on this on this trajectory now, just with this added, he's getting back that 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 Westbrook edge and then the finishing off plays inside and taking guys and bumping the crap out of them. And, you know, and, and and to me, for whatever reason, that seemed to be an area that needed to be kind of worked out between he and and, and the Darvin Ham and the coaching staff and the other players. And now it looks like it's kind of working out. And I, and I like his, 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 his body language, the way he's approaching the game, what he's doing, the results are there. And I think if you wanted to start him now, I think it'd be a, a Russell Westbrook who would embrace being able to figure out what I need to do on a given night. I can't be the Russell Westbrook, you know, one size fits all. I'm gonna get out there and shoot and give me, give me this frenetic energy I always give you and then, and then take, you know, shots, uh, bad shots and this shot and that shot. I think now he's in a mindset where he'll be a much more positive contributor to what they're trying to do collectively as a team. From the media standpoint on, on, on how Russell looks at the game, right? So off camera, we was talking to Bill. Um, uh, Bradley up in Washington. Okay. So he was like, um, when the trade happened, he said when the trade happened and uh, Russell got to Washington, we're in the middle of practice. We're practicing, right? We're practicing. He came, sat down. He's watching practice. He says we go up about six, seven times. And then he's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> stop, stop, stop. He says, do y'all know who the fuck this is? Do y'all know who the this is this is Bradley Beal. Y'all done went up seven times and that man ain't touched the ball yet. He mm. is option one, two, three, four, five. Mm. This man gets the ball and y'all are in position to shoot when he's ready to pass you the ball. Not the other way around. Mm. I don't know what y'all doing out here, but going seven times up and down without him getting the ball first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, y'all are crazy. Yeah. And he's Bill's like. Okay. I like this guy. Who's the coach? <laughs> God, who's the coach? It was a, but was it Scott Brooks? Yeah, Scott, 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 Brooks. Scott Brooks. Okay. Scott Brooks. Okay. Yeah, it was Scott yeah. Brooks. But he was like, yo, I'd never heard a, 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 another player like at that caliber, but like, yo, he's number yeah. one. He said, and when we played, he's looking for me. Right. You know, and he's like, yo, I miss dude. <laughs> like, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. He said, that's the type of dude that like you would think how he plays, he's this selfish being. Right. But he really understands. He's like, no, this man is number one and I'm looking for him. Right. If I don't find him, then I'll go do my thing. Yeah. And, and to that point, I mean, so whatever, what I've said about Russell Westbrook, I love Russell Westbrook. I love everything about him. I do feel, what is he, 34 years old? 32. Or 30, is he 32? No, 32. 32. Is he just 32? 32. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, th but those four yeah. years of triple-double basketball. 34. 34. Oh, he's 34. He's 34. Okay, so those, th but those four years, you know, you, you, yeah, it's yeah, got yeah. to, it's got to taken something out of him. Mm -hmm. You know, just something, a little bounce out, but something has got to, when you, when you play at that level, and it's one of the most remarkable achievements and the, it, it, to me, that doesn't get enough um, they down, accolades. They downplay. Well, they, they the say he's, he's a stat patter, he's stat chasing. This like stat chasing I don't rebounds care. I don't care. in the NBA game. But that's my yeah, point. Yeah. If people who never played, well, oh, that shit. It's like, motherfucker, you would not get. I rebound right, in right. this game. And so he gets the MVP. The one year he he he. he Averages a triple double. The next year he averages a triple double. He's not even in the top five, seven, or eight. You know what I mean? That, is, that doesn't make sense. If you're, if you're good enough to triple double MVP, then the next year, not that you should get the MVP, but you should, should be, be in the conversation. Every, every year you average a triple double, you should be in the conversation. I think that's why now it makes sense on what happened to Will. They yeah. make it look so easy. easy. Right, right. They made it look so easy that it becomes one of those things like, yeah, that's, yeah. he's just doing what he does. Right. You know, that's right. true, but I'm just, you know, you know 30, 10, 11. Right. He just, right. that's, right. that's right. him. They yeah. talk about pace, and yeah, okay, there might be more shots and more opportunities to get stats, but there's also nine other dudes on the court right. who are all trying to get bread and get contracts that, that want to get those stats as well. Listen, you can't, you can't, like, it's an effort. Like, him getting the rebound is an effort play. Yeah. So, that re those rebounds is effort. There's, we can all do this, right? right? The assists, I'm pretty sure Magic Johnson was chasing assists. Yeah. I'm pretty sure uh, uh, Steve Nash was chasing assists. Chris right. Paul chases right. assists. Yeah. John Stockton chases it. So I, I'm pretty sure when he's trying to get 10 assists, I'm pretty sure no one's complaining about this one. It's funny you one. say that quick story. I'm playing with the Clippers, and, and Norm Nix is my point guard. Uh -huh. and, and Norm, I'm coming up the left way. He passes me the ball. I take it, you know, and I make another dribble, and I pass to somebody else. And Norm's like, Marcus, man, shoot the ball, man. I thought, no, nah, I was creating for, like, Rory White or something on 
on the left wing. He's like, no, nah, man, you messing up my assist, baby. Come on, I passed you the ball for you to shoot it, baby. So, like you're saying, the point guards mm-hmm. are so aware of those types of things. And the other point, too, with Russell, if it was that easy, Everybody <laughs> do it. somebody else would do it. When somebody else going to average a triple-double in this league? I don't know if it's ever going to happen. I mean, Giannis... Jokic, I mean, you got some guys who are flirting with the, with the, with the rebounding and assists, but, you know, I just, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to happen. It has to be somebody who has that type of energy. En- that energy, that, yeah, that uh, high Luka, usage, that Luka's usage. Luka's probably the closest yeah, one. Yeah, that, that Luka's a good one. Luka's Luka. a good one. Luka's yeah. a good one. He, yeah. he could get the rebounding is there, he, the assists, yeah. Because he's going to get, the, the assist is probably the easier one for him, and just right. him focusing on rebounding. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's the other thing. Make them shots. That's yeah, the deal. Well, but with the usage rate, so Luca and Giannis, all these guys. Russell was like, I think, has the NBA record for usage, forty plus mm-hmm. percent usage of the possessions, available possessions. Luca's up around thirty six, thirty seven. Giannis, same thing this year, just behind him, I think. It's interesting. I, I, I think if Magic, I looked at uh, Magic's usage, he never, I believe, went above 30%. So, he was always in the 20s. Larry Bird, I think, one mm-hmm. year may have approached 30, but he was always in the mid 20s. And, 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 and it's a term that they use, the heliocentric uh, uh, approach where you put the ball in one guy's hands, Giannis, LeBron, mm-hmm. Luka, KD to a certain extent, and just kind of let the offense run through it, which, is, which makes sense. I mean, it's your best player, and they should have uh, the majority of touches. But my, 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 my point is more that if some of these old, I mean, if Magic would have had the ball that much, or Bird had it that much, you know. This is, you can answer this. If Magic Johnson had these assist rules, yeah. What would he be averaging? But when you say these, what do you mean? Just the, how liberal Back they are? Back then it was like pass and shoot. Okay. You put the ball on the floor, one, two, and create, they don't give you that assist. Ah. They, back then, they do that now. So I can pass the ball to you at half court, and you can take it and create and dunk, and they give me that assist. Yeah, yeah. What would his assist be if you can add two dribbles and shoot? Yeah, I mean. 19 a game? Right. I mean, and, and again, my point, too, is, is, is that that's valid, but also just if, you got, if he's got the ball in his hands. More. like As, uh, as much as these guys are, you know, every, every possession is but just. But that's the one, that's the one that, but that's, that's the, that's the, yeah. the, the, the one player that when I look at today's rule and look at his, his assist, 11-13, yeah. right. in that era? Right, like, right, yeah. If right. he was in this era with, the, 14, with, the extra, with the extra dribble and creative rule, yeah. man, this man would have been at like 17, 18, yeah. 19 easy. Yeah, talk about it's highlights. Crazy. He's one of my favorite guys. His highlights, you know, and I, I'm, I'm a contemporary. I guarded him. I know him. I've hung out with him, but I get just excited <laughs> watching, 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 watching some of it. Oh, man, his highlights yeah. to me are just like unparalleled in terms of just the most, in terms of entertainment value. Watching, even till today. Yeah, I'm just yeah. saying, and even today, watching Magic Johnson highlights, I get excited. I just, I start screaming at the TV or the phone <laughs> or whatever, like, what? Hey.